So I'm back with Jody, my sister, Jody Weber. And um, hopefully you listened to our first podcast. We were talking about conversational styles and making that part of a goal to allow a space for learning to happen um, in the midst of conversation. And um, that Jody's working on um, training teachers in what they call instructional conversation. And um, as a language therapist, I am so interested in all the ways we use our language system to both strengthen our cognition and express what we know and share um, thinking with others, you know, that we are all part of a great conversation, right? That's what uh, reading and writing has kind of been described at as part of being a part of the great conversation. And I think now we live in a world where um, these co this conversation of ideas and the learning of ideas and the sharing of ideas is happening in a lot of different modalities, like the one we have right now, which is, you know, video conferencing. So um, I wanted Jody to spend some time talking about a piece of research that's very interesting. Um, that she shares um, on different uh, types of learning and levels of learning. So Jody, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Thank you. Um, so John Hattie has done a lot of work on something that he calls visible learning. And he has done a uh, meta study of looking at um, a large group, I'm trying to find the exact number. Uh, it synthesizes the findings from 1400 meta analysis of 80,000 studies involving 300 million students into what works best in education. Yeah, I love so, that line. Just to interrupt you for a minute. It's because please, interrupting. please. <laughs> but I just thought, wow, you know, when you put it that way, we're not just talking about um, here's what Rita thinks, here's what Jody thinks. We're talking about, um, or even this is the bias of one researcher. This is really a synthesis, which means it's really looking at across research and across various studies. Um, I think this came out of Australia as well. Yes, he is from Australia. He's from Australia, but the yes, studies were all over the world, I believe. All over the world, yes. Right. And uh, there are two researchers, Fisher and Fry, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry, who um, have created a, a number of professional texts and uh, in-service learning, et cetera, for teachers based on Hattie's work. So mm -hmm. if you are looking for this, you could look at it under John Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E, or under Fisher and Fry, with Fry spelled F-R-E-Y, mm -hmm. um, and, and to see more, more about this for yourselves. Um, but so the way that he shares his work is he uh, looks at some influence or some approach and looks at whether or not or what what kind of impact it has positively or negatively on the education of a student and um an example or, or just kind of to frame it up you want to get at least one year of growth from one year of instruction right we expect that that when your child enters second grade that they learn at the rate of a second grader and are ready for third grade at the end of that year. But if your child enters third grade and they are actually two grade levels behind in their skill and ability, be it because of, you know, um, developmental delays or cognitive delays or, or all kinds of or emotional movement. trauma I mean, or emotional trauma, trauma right? yes or they've moved around a lot or whatever it is whatever the reason you that one year of growth for one year of instruction is not going to be enough they're never going to catch up they will always stay two years behind so that's where there's a need 
for additional support. And um, Rita, that's the kind of thing that you have been providing students. They are students who just getting business as usual is not ever going to catch them up. They need a stronger intervention, a stronger support. Yeah. Can and, I interject here? Please. And so one of the reasons I thought this was such an important information to share is people like me are always out there talking about using strategies. Um, I often tell parents it's not so much the program you use, the strategy you use for home educators, it's the strategy you use. Um, and I see this with children I work with who are in traditional school. Um, the strategies we use is what makes a difference. So what is important about this work is it really is a look at um, developing a learning model and a look at um, when I talk about uh, that I think a strategy is effective, um, am I right? Is it true? Is it just my observation, maybe the way I do it or something? Or is it in fact a strategy that is demonstrated to be an effective strategy? And I think that's important. I, I agree 100% because if we are just doing things because the child likes it, are we nice. teaching them? It's nice, <laughs> but are we teaching them? You know? Well, especially if we're in catch-up mode. Um, you know, yes. there's lots of time out for lots of kinds of learning that can just have value in being joyful. Um, but also, there's some learning. I mean, you don't want to be in school all day. You want the amount of time you're spending to be um, effective, and you want um, kids keeping up and possibly even catching up um, if they're strugglers. So... So yeah, I mean, joy is great. We go for that. Um, and, and I would argue that if you use the right strategies, you get more joy. <laughs> I agree, I agree. An example that I'm going to give though for the, just because kids like it, uh, one time I went in to observe in a fifth grade classroom and the standard that they were uh, presumably working on was uh, parts of the cell and the teacher had them frosting cookies. Uh, I, looking at her lesson plan, the idea was that they were delineating the various parts of the cell on these cookies. Um, number one, I would say that that was a pretty low level skill for 10 and 11 year olds. Number two, they weren't doing it. <laughs> Number three, they were learning a lot about what happens when you mix pink and blue frosting. <laughs> so it was a good art lesson. But that was not the instructional goal. If you ask the kids though, did they like the lesson? The answer was yes. So we have a responsibility as educators, home educators or school educators. I'm private educator. Exactly. That when we have set a go an instructional goal, that the activity that we connect to that is effective. Otherwise, we're just wasting everyone's time. And, and I'm not saying that frosting cookies isn't a lovely thing to do. But those children had that period of time to learn science. And they will not, and, and what hurt my heart even more, it was at a minority school where all of the students in that school were Latino with a small percentage of African Americans. Well, those children are not going to grow up to be scientists. They're going to grow up to work in a bakery based on that lesson. You know, we were not really driving home some critical information for them. About, so, be, about being a scientist. Is about being a scientist and, right. and the functions of biology. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of really important information to learn. And we don't have the luxury of frosting cookies right. during that, that small window of time that we have. So what we were talking about is with Hattie, when Hattie has looked at this work, he has looked for the, the impact or the effect size that each thing has had. And if you are getting 
uh, one year of growth for one year of instruction, it has an effect size of 0.4. So that's your, you want everything to have at least a 0.4 effect size. However, if you've got kids who need more, then you want it to be more than that. You'd like it to be, for example, 0.8, because that means they're getting two years of growth for one year of instruction. And I don't know what all he has put under this umbrella, but for example, Rita, interventions for learning disabled students, which are the kinds of work that you do in your private practice, has in general for all of the studies he's looked at an effect size of 0.77. Right. So they are getting somewhere between a year and a half and two years growth for that one year of time with you. That's awesome. Yeah, right. That's yeah. beautiful, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is very much what you wanna see. Um, so as, as we look at, at our work and we look to pull out, you know, what effect size does um, our kinds of things do? I was, oh, and another one, by the way, that I know you, you probably have seen and would cherish is uh, phonics instruction, 0. 0.70. 0. 0.70, right. 0. 0.70, and, and that's huge. Repeated reading, 0.75. Spelling programs, 0.58. Vocabulary programs, 0.62. Well, and I would argue what vocabulary programs, though, too. So Absolutely. And I don't know. But yeah. because of his work, right. you know, mm -hmm. 1,400 meta-analysis of 80,000 studies involving 300, you know, right. like it's not. But we're safe. trying. Right. There are other venues to look at does this particular, for example, what works clearinghouse is a space to see, does this particular approach make a difference? Right. Is looking at general. So I think that's interesting because, you know, I want to give some examples of things we assume um, and that people tell us that maybe um, in my reading research doesn't play out and you just mentioned reading and you just mentioned vocabulary and I think those are good things um, to talk about. So for example, an assumption for reading is that if you read aloud to children, they'll learn to read. And the truth is, um, well, truth, what the research supports is reading aloud to children teaches them a lot about literacy and about books and how books work. Um, but, um, in, you know, specific instruction on decoding, like phonics programs, are more successful in teaching kids how to read. There are some children who may, in fact, pick up reading from just being read to, but it's not the norm, and it doesn't give you the kinds of numbers that something like phonics instruction would give, for example. So, And, and I'm not important. familiar with anyone who believes that reading aloud to children teaches them how to read. Even back in the whole language day. Right. You'd be surprised not, though what it was not said. in isolation. Right. You'd be surprised what's said. Like people may view learning to read as being something that comes naturally like learning to talk. And that's been part of what I'm not saying it's in the education field. I'm just saying that's for example, I remember learning um, for struggling readers, sustained silent reading. <laughs> is not helpful for a struggling reader because a struggling reader is likely to either be not reading because they can't read it or spending the whole time on bad strategies like just trying to puzzle it out and guessing. They're not actually engaged in reading. For a struggling reader, sustained silent reading has to be at a level where they're successful. So you can see where you could take an idea, oh, sustained silent reading, that's so important that we have time where kids read independently. Yes, if they know how. Yes, <laughs> and that no, is where they don't. So you can see where this discussion of strategies is also, you know, an important piece that we try to tease out for everybody. And that is where Hattie's work on surface deep and transfer right. learning plays in. Right. So he discovered that same thing as that analogy he, you just used um, is sustained silent reading is not in and of itself a good or a bad strategy. 
it depends on when it's used. Right. There are times that it's used. It's a horrible strategy and will have very little effect size. There are other times it's used that it has huge effect size. Right. Another example that he gives is project-based learning. That overall, project-based learning came out as having a pretty low effect size, which mm -hmm. was surprising. But when he looked at it more carefully, what he found is if it was used in the very beginning, before kids really knew what they were even doing or talking about or have the ability to make connections, it was a very poor strategy that had very low impact. If, however, later, after they had a strong understanding of content and a lot of, of ideas and, and words to put around it, then project-based learning had a huge effect size. Right. They gave the example in the article about the first-year med students doing project-based learning versus the third-year med students doing project-based learning. And this really leads us to this idea of these different levels of understanding, um, these different uh, levels of learning. Right. So surface learning is um, just like teaching that beginning skill. You know, you're really working at um, helping them understand the content, the concept, the vocabulary, everything that they need. And, and a, a huge part of that is that there are right answers, <laughs> right, you know? And um, with that comes a challenge that comes with that is that kids sometimes will um, sort of lock down because they know there's a right answer and so they're hesitant, they're searching to give you the right answer, you know, instead of really processing the information. So that's that thing to sort of guard against. But surface learning is what we call in classrooms direct instruction. And this is where we, you know, tell teachers that even though we are teaching instructional conversation that we sometimes call collaborative conversation with joint productive activities, we are not saying do not engage in direct instruction. We are saying that's critical. You've got to have that. Just to your analogy, you can't just read to kids. They have to be taught how to read. So right there is where that surface learning applies. The, the risk is that you could stop there. Right. That's often the kind of information that our standardized tests are, are testing for. And it's critical information. It's not to dismiss the importance of it. It's just you are not developing thinkers and independent learners if you're just stopping there. You're creating little robots. Right. Go right. ahead. And, and for the struggling learner, they have to stay in that place longer than they want to and maybe longer than their peers. So that is a, that's difficult because um, they really need more time in that instructional uh, period. And so we have to find ways to help them keep building and get to the next levels even while still having instruction at this level. So it's easy to think, oh, here's this surface level learning that they're talking about, and then you get to go to this next level, but this child's stuck here. And so part of our goal is to say, yes, but this little piece can go off to this level. Exactly. This piece can go off to that level. And you're at this level and suddenly you realize, oh, we need to come back here and do a little bit of the skill training. So I just wanted to interject that as she presents this, and the research talks about this as well, um, it's easy to think of it as very linear, but it's actually um, very convoluted and, uh, you know, we can move back and forth between these levels of learning. And should move back and, and forth. should move back and yeah. forth. Yeah, and, and when we're done, let, um, I want to wrap that back to zone of proximal development. Let's, let's come back to that. But, but to stay, yes, <laughs> but to stay... Um, so that's surface learning, and, and your point is critical, that it's not, and, and we used to do that, or some still do, where it's called mastery learning, where mm -hmm. we believed 
the child could not go forward until they had mastered right. these critical skills. Well, you know, you could be 16 years old and still, you know, not moving forward, which you're going to drop out of school and be done, you know, so. Right. That's, or yeah. worse still, you get pushed along and the skill training was skipped and that's happened too. And Exactly. And that, that is, and right. that's in, in schools, that's if you hear people talking about response to intervention or RTI, those are the methods of doing exactly what, Rita, you're talking about. They're continuing to move forward in their grade, but that is a process where schools are looping them back to those critical skills right. that they've missed while continuing, because they're good thinkers, right? They've right. got all kinds of ideas. They need support with some of this direct surface learning kind of stuff while we continue to push them forward. Right. So that's a, another side loop. Um, but deep, deep learning, back to Hattie's work, first yeah. comes surface learning, and then the next thing he talks about is deep learning. And this is where we believe that collaborative conversation really uh, becomes so important. And that is where kids are taking what they've learned, what they know, and they're beginning to play with it. They're, they're exploring what this looks like and feels like and could it apply here and what if it looked like that and they're really um, digging deeper and during this stage of things this is where it's really important that kids have the time and the space to dig in and that the teacher is stepping back a little bit. So um, one of the common problems we have is that teachers may try to save children too quickly. So if they don't know the answer, to jump in and help them. And, and if kids are ready to be at this stage with things, or you're trying to find out if they are, you need to to let them be there a little bit. And um, this is the learning pit that, that we've talked about before, where <clears throat> kids go into the pit to work on whatever activity, or in our case, a joint productive activity, and you let them be in that pit. You let them play with ideas and struggle a little bit. You don't let them flounder. You don't want it to be destructive, but you're looking for productive struggle. So it might be you jump in with a little something and jump back out. Or it might be that you provide a clue and then step away. And, and you, you help them as they negotiate all of that thinking, but they're the ones negotiating the thinking because that's that thrill that John Hattie talks about later. That's that part where you feel proud of yourself and you've accomplished it and you know and you understand or you came up with that idea or you saw the way the character in that text related to the character of that text. That's powerful stuff. And it reinforces that you are a, a strong learner. Right. Let me just interject here how that kind of dovetails with some of what the wording I use. So mm -hmm. I talk a lot about skills, teaching, teaching skills, and then the consolidation of skills. So that it's not enough to learn how to decode. Mm -hmm going back to the reading, you want an, an, an encode, you want to actually be now putting this, practicing whatever that is in reading and writing. So you don't have to wait, but whatever level you're working on in skill can go in. You can go over to consolidating. The problem is if this learner's here and the activity you're thinking of, that learning pit, that time, you know, that great time that you think will be fun, is too big of a gap, then the struggling learner can drown. And I often right. say no one learns to swim by drowning. So right. there's a way you can do this kind of supportive work and try to be sure that 
whatever kids are spending some time with that they know how to do it that they have some tools behind them so you keep moving this is what i mean about keep moving back between what might be service learning and what might be deep learning so for example when um i wrote the book um trees in the forest about deep comprehension I, what I saw was a lot of kids were being told, you need to annotate text. I want you to annotate. I want you to analyze, take this piece of literature and analyze it because a test is coming up, a state test. And on that state test, you have to be able to, we're in Ohio, not Georgia, but you have to be able to annotate. And there were all these skills about that that they didn't know yet. But, so, so I tried to break in on some of those by giving some methods and some little bit of work, but it was a play between that, here, do this, but while you're doing that, you're going, because we're re using real literature, you're going a little deeper into text and you're getting into that deeper learning too. Um, so I'm just using that as examples of what Jody's talking about. And that's a great example. And to, to uh, kind of, dovetail into our work there uh Vygotsky has has talked a lot about something called the zone of proximal development and the, the zpd and the zpd is that space that you want the child needs to be for learning and if you were to um, take a piece of paper and and break it into four blocks the the lower left hand corner is kind of the place where just that that surface learning that real basic kind of thing happens so an example that paula mellum gives when she does our institute is if someone is learning how to swim in that block that's where they're getting their face in the water and learning to blow bubbles and holding on to the side of the wall and kicking their feet and maybe you're holding them while they float all of those are critical things to learning how to swim if you look at the the lower right hand quadrant that's that sort of fluency sort of thing so in swimming it's your swimming laps you're swimming laps, you're building up your endurance, you're maybe getting some coaching on stroking, but really you're just swimming lap after lap after lap. The top left quadrant would be like a water park. Mm -hmm. It's just fun, it's exciting. And because you're comfortable in the water, you're gonna be comfortable going down that slide and into the pool. The top right hand quadrant is like the Olympics or like Big competition right? right you're you're swimming it's high stakes whatever high skill high skill high skill right. high skill so yeah you're definitely you're looking at that that intersection of all of that you can't live in any one of those quadrants right you can't be at the Olympics every single day right you can't do nothing but kill and drill right if you just go to the water park you're never really going to learn how to swim. You have to have all of that in there. And that middle section, right in the middle there, is where that child needs to be for their learning. But it changes all the time, and, and we say it's recursive. So you don't want them just in one quadrant in their learning. You want them, even if they are learning how to read, if Harry Potter is the big thing, then that's that read aloud for Harry Potter, and yeah. that's like the or water audio. park. Right. Yeah, yeah. or audio, mm -hmm. or, you know. Mm -hmm. But then you also, you you want, if, if Junie B. Jones, even though they read higher than Junie B. Jones, but that's a space of comfort and good practice and whatever, you want them to have that opportunity just for building up their endurance and whatever. Mm -hmm. But you also... In teaching, you need to have them more at the instructional level, where where you are lifting their learning to that next phase and then helping them to apply it and put it, whatever. So, you know, there's like a, 
an art and a science to yes. teaching. Right, right. And right. it all comes, begins, and ends. And you guys talk about this in your podcast with knowing your student. Mm -hmm. You've got to right. know your kids. Right, right. And, you know, you think about that in, in terms of reading, that we um, will work with kids to teach them how to read. And we want them to practice with some controlled text for a little while. Or we want some independent reading that's at a level where they're 95% accurate. Correct. Or right. we want them practicing reading aloud at a level that they're really having to apply those good skills. Right. And that is going to be a slightly higher level. Right. And then they also, as you mentioned, be listening to an audio book that's more at their interest level or grade level. Maybe right. for subject areas that um, they are not yet able to read independently, that they could be doing that audio work at that level. Right. Um, so, so it's a perfect example of a way that we don't just say, and I see this sometimes among home educators, if they're struggling this much, then audio books, like technology is available now. Right. So, and I, don't, I shouldn't just say home educators because I see this also in – um, the, the public domain as well, there may be, well, we'll just use, you know, speech to text. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, that's great for some things. And yet we still want to work on writing, right? We mm -hmm. still, we don't want to abandon the skill. Right. Just because there are other options. So I love that about this, that um, this is not an either or decision. It's, it's a very dynamic learning process. Exactly. And you say that beautifully. Yep. That's exactly right. This is why and, I love my sister, because she says things like that. <laughs> and <laughs> means it. And I mean it. <laughs> so then the last part of, of Hattie's work, uh, looping back to that, so we've talked about surface learning, then we've gone into deep learning, and then transfer is really where the kids are, um, they're taking it to the next level. You know, they have a strong understanding, they're excited about it, and they are making that connection. So they've read one text, and they've watched a movie, and they've experienced something, and they're saying, wow, this is like in this book, this character did this, but in the movie it was this, and makes me connect with my life where this happened. You know, they are making that deep connection and transferring it across settings and in their own lives and in their own way, and that's, boy, that's the magic, isn't it? That's what we want. Right. Exactly. And yeah. I refer to that as, you know, like digging up some passion. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and that passion can come from the educator as well. You yes. Know? So much oh, of how I'm excited about a topic can really help kids be excited about a topic. But it can't be so far over their head that they're I mean, who enjoys that? You know, exactly. I'm always relating it to something I'm not good at. I'm not good at it. I don't enjoy it. I mean, I've got to have some level of proficiency for me to feel that joy. Right. And, um, but being with someone who is excited about it too helps stimulate that as well. So it's something that the educator needs to think about as well, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, what I think is so valuable about people – um, taking your class or listening to your podcasts or reading your blogs or whatever. We have to do that for ourselves as educators. We have to connect with other people's thinking. So you and I do this, you know, over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever, because we're, we're both just so passionate about it. Um, my colleague Paula and I can't shut up. You know, we, mm -hmm. we are constantly thinking about and making connections and wondering and exploring ideas and talking to teachers and finding out because that lifts the work. Yeah. That conversation really matters when you apply what you know and understand and explore it with what somebody else knows and understands and make those connections and develop your own thinking further. 
that that is, I think, such a critical thing to being a good educator. Right. And it takes time. I think that's one of the things that um, I think is the piece that's the hardest for everyone to get. It's the piece of life that none of us have enough of. Right. But that you have to be in a topic for a while. Yes. You have to have some time to mess mm -hmm. with it. And um, certainly in a school environment, that can be really hard to get because there's a lot it's of challenge. demands for all of the learning going on, you yeah. know, and uh, what's expected, you know, yeah. and I think that's hard. But, you know, I think it's hard for home educators, too. Mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, you worry, it, do I have the time for this? You know, mm -hmm. can I take this kind of time? Um, it's easy to be want to just check the boxes. Because mm -hmm. that's the easy way. What we're talking about is actually, um, you know, uh, messy. It's, mm -hmm. it's messy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it requires some time. Mm -hmm. And yet, we know this about ourselves. We're learning something new. I always like to relate it back to something personal because I feel like it's easy to be philosophical about everybody else. But then when you see something <laughs> in your own life, you know, you go, oh, wait, oh, well, that's true, it's, you know. It's me but, too. <laughs> oh, I mean, so, you know, take something simple like cooking, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it's a drudgery. Some of it requires skills. Some mm -hmm. of it requires, you know, this extra reading. And, and but a lot of it is also time. Mm -hmm. And you just have to, like, make that mistake and make that connection and find mm -hmm. that shortcut. And, mm -hmm. You know, and, and do you love it all the time? No. But do you love it some of the time? Well, maybe still no, but maybe yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's, there's these things about things we've learned in life that we forget mm -hmm. that like to be a learner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, again, in our setting with classrooms, and you, you captured the challenge for teachers exactly. Um, just as the teachers worry about, when do I have time to do this? How do and we, we talk through those issues? Um, you know, the pressure they're feeling is, I've got to get on to math. It's time for lunch. I can't be late for, you know, if I'm late for recess, they only get 20 minutes as it is, you know just all of those things with the schedules, the kids are under the same pressures. Yeah, right. And what kids say when we say, why do you like instructional conversations? What about it is good? They say to us things like, it's patient. I have time to think. Yeah. We talk about things for a while. You know, that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's huge. I think we we underestimate, and that brings us full loop to that different processing speeds, be a slower processor and be running through a schedule, be at home or school or trying to get out the door on Sunday morning or whatever it is, you know, and then give them a space where their learning can be more patient. Yeah. Right. Watch what happens. Right. It's interesting. I used to say to my kids' teachers, um, I would say, I bet if you had all these parents here for a week running through this schedule, you oh. would have a lot of angry parents. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, you know, there would be criticism that so-and-so didn't remember to take their homework home. Well, there is exactly five minutes to get from your last class to the bus through your locker. Right. Only, only the most gifted, organized student is really going to manage that. Right. And, and you know, I could see it in my, you know, so I, I would, my son, I would pick him up. Right. Just so we had time. Right. Think about what he needed to bring home for homework, you know. So there's right. a lot of things like that, and it's out of the teacher's control. Yeah, absolutely. So you, but but it's important to realize. I think work like you're doing, that's investing in that message. That be have some patience. Build in time. Time is valuable. Mm -hmm. Learning that happens in that space. Mm -hmm. the better learning mm -hmm. than, you know, the test that's taken or the, you know, and I think teachers know this, but they need the voices of the researchers behind them. 
They do. And, you know, I mean, you and I didn't go to a school that looked like that. No. Right? No. And we were in, you know, private whatever schools, and they didn't look like that. Mm -hmm. And I had very small classes, and I didn't have to battle through hundreds of kids in a hallway and right. all of those things. And still, I didn't learn that way. As a teacher, nothing about my methods classes prepared me to teach this way. And, and then the as whole assessment thing that came on really pushed all of that oh, yeah. even further. So what this is doing, like I say, it's bringing the pendulum back, but I don't know how long ago was it there, not in our lifetime. Um, but as a result, it's also, we can say to teachers, give kids more time, but if they don't know what to do with that time, right. if they don't know how to facilitate, if they don't know that what they're watching there is productive struggle and it's a type of formative assessment that is far more valuable than paper pencil, but pay attention to that, take notes, reteach based on, etc. Like that is a very active process. It's not a passive process, mm -hmm. but it's different than what they've experienced as learners or they, they learned in preparation to be a teacher. Um, and, and so just as we can't expect kids to just go do this, we can't expect teachers to either. Right. They have to learn. They have to. And part of what we talk about um, to both the teachers and to the administrators is um, we have to give teachers a space to kind of jump in the sandbox. You know, they have to they have to start with a group of kids they feel confident with in a content area that they see a natural match as many times during the week as makes sense to them and their schedule mm -hmm. and get started. What we have found is once teachers get started, they very quickly see the value of it and go further with it. Um, I would venture to say that for a homeschool parent, a similar approach, not that they're choosing their groups, but um, think about when they look at their content, what can they imagine allowing that space for? And start right. there. Right. And just do it there. Don't, mm -hmm. don't do it everywhere. We have an eighth grade social studies teacher who uh, only does it kind of uh, at the end of sort of mini units along the way. He has them look at historical documents and he creates a instructional conversation based around looking at this document and determining whether or not it's a valid historical document or is it propaganda or is it whatever. Um, and an example of this is that iconic photo of um, the, the weathered woman in the middle of the Dust Bowl with children all around her. Do you remember that that photo? It's kind Oh, yes, of, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, and she's just kind of like this. And, well, you know, I've always thought that that was, you know, the Dust Bowl during the Depression. Well, you know, the president sent out a photographer to purposefully capture, and this woman had a look in her children, and they did multiple photos because it helped people across the country understand what was happening with the Depression and the Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. People in Georgia didn't know that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, right. it, so, so where do you put that? It was a form of propaganda. It was also capturing something very real. Well, that's a rich conversation to have. Right. Right. You know, well, so that, that when you cross the line, that's a good conversation for today, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But so on. he found his space where not just with his schedule, but for his instructional goal, that doing this was exactly what he needed them to do. A true right. false test, even even a short answer kind of test was not going to be as rich for the students as having a conversation about it and and 
uh, having productive disagreements on it. Right, right. Well, and I think, um, you know, for a home educator, you can be on the other side too, um, in that you could really value these experiences, but then worry, you know, is this going to translate? So, you know, we talk a lot about having these writing moments and um, authentic writing and bits and pieces of writing and, you know, um, you know, capturing some analysis, but you don't always have to turn it into a paper, right? But then the worry is, but if I don't worry, work on turning it into the paper, will all this lead to turning it into the paper, you know? So I think it can be easy. And to that's those quadrants, that. right? Yeah. Right. I mean, you yeah. gotta. Yeah, I'm gonna create one of those about writing because I already have ideas of, um, you know, what I see, and I think writing is one of the areas, honestly, in education where we do not give enough space. We tend to look at the end result and say we teach how to fill in these this format you know we need to teach that you're going to cite research this way right so yeah okay but then that every paper has to have that same format and we kind of tend to work backwards instead of letting there be this conversation about um is this valid is is this worth citing right <laughs> um, and then if I do cite it, how do I cite it? Well, how do I really, you know, we teach kids that, oh, if you're going to put in a quote, you have to introduce that quote, and then you have to explain that quote. Well, mm -hmm. so that's the formula. That's the writing formula. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could do that in conversation when I'm looking at this photograph, mm -hmm. I actually have learned how to introduce something like that and translate it back. Mm -hmm. I've done it verbally. That was excellent work. Mm -hmm. that will someday translate to that paper. But we worry about giving writing time. And writing, of all things, um, you know, there was a researcher who once said that writing is the coup de grace mm -hmm. of all language skills. And I mm -hmm. think it's really true. That's why it's so hard. That's why it's hard to teach, mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. it needs even more time. And, you know, I, I don't know what Ohio tests look like, but in the state of Georgia, when we moved to what's now called the Georgia Milestone, writing became a higher criteria. Right. Um, the, the assessments are given online, which has its own problems for men, children, mm -hmm. et cetera. But starting, uh, they're only given it uh, third grade. And, uh, but still, there's mm -hmm. all of that. Um, but it, it would be almost impossible to score, you know, it, you, there are all those reasons, nonetheless, as unfortunately happens, but in this case positively, assessments drive instruction. And because of this kind of change, there is more value in time being spent in writing across the curriculum. And there is a, a greater emphasis on kids being able to uh, put thoughts down on paper that they can't be prepared for. You cannot prepare a child for this kind of test because it's not just spitting out answers. Right, it's no. going to be something new they read that they have to respond to. And I agree, I think- Or synthesi synthesi just synthesizing right. kind of prior knowledge right. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But so, what, we, what we have found so far in in a evidence-based kind of way, meaning that teachers tell us this, is that when kids spend time engaged in instructional conversation, it is translating to their writing. When they talk about it, they can then go write about it, which as educators is not a shock. We just haven't provided the space for that and we weren't taught to provide a space. Right, for that. right. And so, that's what I like about this too, is that I agree that what I see that I like is way more emphasis on time spent writing and, um, and going deeper into text. Um, I think there's some interesting conversation about the choices of text, but, um, but I think that the temptation is to try to be formulaic instead of what you are teaching which is to allow for that. Um, there's a 
program, a writing uh, group called Brave Writer, and she talks about having big, juicy conversations. Mm -hmm. That writing requires time spent in these big, juicy conversations and what mm -hmm. that does for writing. And I think that that's what you're calling instructional conversation. She's calling the big, juicy conversations. I like that terminology. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, like even the formulaic writing, there's a place for that. Right. Okay. Like put that on the quad, you know, there it's is the swimming just, laps part. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. The risk is if you just stay there. Right. Exactly. It's teaching only in one of those quadrants. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think your earlier example of icing the cookies was fun. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a water slide. It wasn't it wasn't hitting enough of what the goal was to really mm -hmm. fit in that quadrant. It could have mm -hmm. actually Should have. with mm -hmm. a different cookie structure mm -hmm. and or a different mm -hmm. kind of project it actually could have it just mm -hmm. missed the mark and and if you only have so much time and we know time is um, meaningful and you want to give time then you want the time you give to to really be the right moment you know mm -hmm. that really lets those ideas settle Mm -hmm. and, and, and then there's free time, you know, I mean, free time, something different. So mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. absolutely say free time's bad. That's not it. We're just talking about actual instructional work. time. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So I just want to clarify because it's easy to feel like, yeah, but kids should be able to ice cookies. Right. That seems feels like an example, like, gosh, what's wrong with icing cookies? Nothing, you know, so. except it's science time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, and, it wasn't it wasn't the Christmas party. Right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the, oh, we're going to have a Christmas party and we're going to ice Christmas cookies and or art. well, or, or it's art. Yeah. And we're going to no. this was science. Mm -hmm. This was a science mm -hmm. lesson with a lesson plan and an instructional goal. Mm -hmm. And, and it was. And, and also, you know, just to say though, not every lesson's a great lesson, right? I mean, we've no. all done that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you just go, eh, could have done that better, should have done it this way. Some So often, that's yes. the value of experience is you don't really know till after you do something how it really should have gone, you mm -hmm. know? And, and, you know, we've all experienced that. And, and I've always felt like the best teachers were the reflective teachers. Yeah. Right. And and for us, the best moms are the reflective moms. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we're all doing the best we can every day. Right. But we also all need to be working at improving upon that or hitting the mark better or or whatever. Um, and and in our work, it is providing a space for a teacher to figure out if she did hit the mark. Right. Yes, exactly. Because actually there's a lot of freedom in thinking, I want to go from surface to deep. I want to go or, and maybe from deep back to surface, or I want to go because I discover these little, you know, holes I need to work on, or I want to go from skill to consolidation to this skill back to consolidation or this quadrant you're talking about. There's actually freedom in that, mm -hmm. that you don't have if you're like, oh, it has to be this program. It has to be this method. It has to be this test. It has to be this kind of paper that actually is more um, limiting. Exactly. And and it can make you feel worse in the end, you know. Exactly. So so that's part of where we're going with that. Okay, well that was a fun conversation. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, thank you, Rita. That was enjoyable. I learned lots. <laughs> Me too, as all. <laughs> as all. Thank you for listening to the Rooted In podcast. For more information, resources, and products, please visit rootedinlanguage.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, and like our Facebook page.